Welcome back to another episode of The Hip. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where every single week I bring you a leader from our sector to discuss some of the biggest challenges in UK housing today. Today, I was delighted to be joined by Mark Howden, Chief Executive of Peaks and Plains. We talked about Mark's transition from the private sector into the public sector, having spent a lot of his years in development within Balfour Beatty. How important it is to have the right team around you and how that's helped him to steer Peaks and Plains into a better place after some trouble with the regulator. And he talks about the future now for Peaks and Plains and how he's excited about what the future success will look like. I really enjoyed this episode and I think it'll give you some real insights on how important it is to build that right leadership team to create a sustainable future for your organisation. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm excited for this. I, uh, I've cancelled twice, so apologies. Third time of asking, <laughs> but we're here now, so that's good. Um, as I always like to start... End. I know. As I always like to start, do you mind just give us an introduction to yourself, Mark? Uh, yeah, okay. I'll try not to bore you too much, but uh, I always say that I'm from uh, from Wakefield, but, uh, you know, I'm not really. I, I'm very proud of that background. Uh, in fact, I've got a season ticket at Leeds United, but uh, the reality is, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's always a controversial way to start. But I, I, I spent time growing up in Wales, uh, in the Middle East, uh, predominantly with my dad's job. Um, and I've lived in Manchester since 1989. So I've actually lived in Manchester longer than I've lived anywhere else. Uh, so, but I'd never described myself as a Manx. Uh, my two kids are grown up. They're both Manx. Uh, and uh, I do have a local connection with Macclesfield where Peaks and Plains operate. Uh, I'm married to Katie and she's from Macclesfield. So uh, around about, I've got connections. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that I always, I always say, I'm a Yorkshireman. But when I actually think about it, I've been a long way away from there, but you know, we're always like that. Um, I've got uh, again, how did I end up? I, well, I didn't end up in housing in the in the typical way, I suppose. I ended up uh, through education, I ended up working in um, in in sort of community support. I did a, I did a degree in economics, and uh, latterly, here we go, a master's in uh, Middle Eastern politics. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, le- you leave Manchester University with, with a master's in Middle Eastern politics, and you go, right, what next? So I ended up bizarrely working in um. Central Manchester, Moss Side, Hume, East Manchester, uh, working on community support. It was it was quite a deep recession at the time. It was John Major's uh, recession, and jobs weren't that great uh, to come by, particularly graduate jobs. Um, but I loved that work, um, and it gave me a really insight into working in those communities. I'm not from those communities, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I then moved when I needed a proper job. Um, I moved to the Train Enterprise Council in Manchester, um, and I worked there uh, for a number of years. That became that was abolished, but that became the um, economic development agency for Greater Manchester, so all ten boroughs. Uh, and I worked specifically on um, working on major infrastructure projects. So that's really my first exposure to the work that that I went into up latterly. So when we had major PFIs in schools, hospitals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I was there to try and support local communities to benefit from from that. Uh, first exposure to housing, though, was when I um, set up something called GM Procure alongside a guy called Mike Brogan. Uh, it's now called Procure Plus, still operating. I believe Mike's yeah. still there. Um, uh, and I was sort of the economic development bit of that. So uh, part of Decent Homes, um, we set that up. Uh, I sat on the board for a number of years, um, and, and, we, and that was part of delivering uh cost savings and economic benefits from uh decent homes um yeah and I, and I was because i was working around major investments in education in health uh you know poacher turn gamekeeper you get tapped up um because i was i was clearly giving them a hard time on the other side of the table and i ended up uh, uh i found myself at balfour bt investments the investment arm of balfour bt so big group uh, um but the the they were very keen as a as a plc to to invest equity into major projects worked there for 11 years um i loved it i felt a bit of an imposter when i first arrived because i felt a little bit out fish out of water but then quickly i realized that the work they were doing was was working in the sectors i'd been exposed to and i worked across a range of sectors in those years so that, that was the brilliant bit i loved it um and I'll come to it, you know, a, a bit more uh, further on. But you know, that led me then to think, well, there was a there was a pause, and there was a moment where I thought, you know, I've been here eleven years. 
Balfour Beatty were kind of going in a different direction. Um, and I got a phone call from um, a, a recruiter, actually. And I always remember this because I, I, I was in a petrol station in Dumfries in Edinburgh. <laughs> because I was working up there at the time. And they said, oh, come and talk to this housing association uh, in, in, in Macclesfield. And I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. And uh, the rest, as I say, is history. So yeah. there we are. Love that. Um, and sort of kind of how, how big of a pull was the commercial experience that you had in picking the role at Peaks and Plains? Because obviously you're a development organisation as yeah. well, aren't you? So how big was that as a driver for you in terms of the opportunity? Peaks and Plains at that time had uh, a very uh, ambitious development programme um, and they'd refinanced. Uh, it was it that was attractive to me. Um, I think what what was also attractive to me was um, because I was looking to move into a different sector. Yeah. Um, it, it it was I felt it would be the right size organisation for me to understand what the drivers were, what the challenges were. Um, but you know, it, it helped that they had the money. It helped that it was in an area where there was going to be decent demand. It helped that I was going to be able to bring some of that um, experience and nous with me. Um, and I really felt it was it was a move that would give me, you know, a good insight into into the challenges. Um, it didn't perhaps pan out that way, um, but uh, yes, it was it was. But it wasn't an easy decision. I did um and ah about it. Um, uh, because you know, I wanted to make sure it was the right move for me. But you know, it, it, these things turn out okay in the end, don't they? They do, and and obviously, like I know the story. So just to paint yeah. the picture a little bit, you joined the business as exec director of place. Is that right? And then I did. It yeah, was did. a bit of a tumultuous um, part for the business. So just talk yeah. us through the journey from joining to kind of where we are. Yeah, yeah. May May um, May nineteen. Uh, I walk into the business and. Um, uh, we've we've refinanced. Uh, we've got a, an ambitious development program. Uh, I've got a chief exec that I'm that I'm getting to know. Um, we've got a new exec director of resources, Jules Booker, who uh, started two weeks after me. Um, and um, within uh, six weeks, um, uh, a number of issues uh, came to light um, uh, around compliance. Uh, and to cut a long story short, um, we found ourselves um, going to the regulator. I was asked by the board to step in um, uh, on an interim basis uh, as CEO, um, which was um, somewhat of a surprise, it's fair to say. Um, but hey, uh, and then uh, I uh, and then we began that journey, and actually. Uh, myself and Jules sat down and we both looked at each other and said, you know, I I'd walked away from, uh, a, a, you know, a, a very successful career at Balfour BT. I still had a lot of connections there. Um, it was almost at the point where I could have picked up the phone and said, you know, hey, <laughs> yeah. any chance I want to come back? Um, uh, Jules was in a similar position. She left another housing association and we both looked at each other and thought, you know what? Uh, if, if we both stick around, uh, we can fix this. And we had some very tough decisions to make uh, very early on, uh, which which required us to um, tighten up that exec team somewhat. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, 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 we kicked on from there, really. And then we went to see the regulator. Hmm. Just, just on that point, I mean, mm. literally thrown into chaos by yeah. the sounds of things in that short yeah. tape period. How difficult was it transitioning, firstly, from the commercial sector and doing what you yeah. were doing at Balfour into a housing association? And then secondly, how hard was it to then transition into a chief exec role for you? What were some of the, the learns in that six, 12 month period, would you say? I suppose this was the I'm describing the organization as it was then, not as it is now. Yeah, of course. So, absolutely. Uh, the, the, I, I was, I was, um, I was a little bit surprised by the the uh, the lack of uh, structure in some of the um, approvals and uh, a grip on some of the the information data, particularly uh, very poor data management. Um, we had um, uh, we we perhaps had a lot of issues which we seem to deal with in hope uh, rather than uh, the realities. 
Um, and so that was the first part. So I was a little bit surprised that. So for for example, when I came in, we had a, we had quite a significant project, and I wanted to see the cost plan. Um, and that was a surprise to people when I asked to see a cost plan, which for my world was everything. Um, and also the fact that we seemed to sort of make sure that we back we back solved everything so everything worked. And I just didn't feel as if we had a grip on things. Um, I didn't feel we were close enough to the projects. I didn't feel that the team were were owning those projects. And I think that was the the the, the biggest culture shock for me. Um, that there was a lot of you know there was a, trust is the wrong word because it was it was just sort of you know it was it was left to chance I suppose. Um, the board were somewhat distanced from distanced from some of the the key issues. Um, when you're thrown in at the deep end as a chief exec, so the first thing the first thing that happens is you think, well, it's not going to be me. And then when you get the call, uh, and you think, right, okay, it is me. Um, there was a little moment where I thought, if I was at Balfour Beatty now, I'd have this big, big PLC yes. uh, structure wrapped around me, and I'd, I'd probably not be in the job. But also, I'd I'd have lots and lots of experts coming to see me to tell me how to do my job. Uh, and then you sort of look around and you go, oh, it's me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that people aren't aren't capable, but it, it suddenly the decision sits with you. And I think that was the biggest shock and the little moment where you go, am I able to do this? Uh, because if you don't do that, I think that you're, you're kidding yourself. Um, and, and there were many days where I where I did that. But, you know, you quickly adjust to it and you think, well, you know, you start thinking, well, I've just got to make decisions in the right way for the right reasons. And I also realised that I just had to make decisions. You can't sit there and and deflect and you can't sit there and ignore what's going on around you. You've got to get on with it. So, yeah, so that, I think that was the that was the the, the 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 biggest challenge for me. And how and how did you manage to bring the people on that journey? Because, like, you know, we're going through similar times now, right? We can learn yeah. something from that experience. But how did you galvanise the team and make sure everyone was on the journey with you and that you had the right level of positivity with the right mm. level of realism? Because there's a it's important to have both, I suppose. If I'm honest, if I was at, if I asked that question and I did it again, I think I I was more positive than real. Okay. Um and. I'm often asked this, what would I do differently? And I I think what I did is I tried for a while to play the overly positive role. Hey. Uh, and what that did was that didn't actually uh, get people to understand where we actually were. Now, right. lessons learned were still here. So, you know, it, it maybe it was the right thing to do. But I think on reflection, I should have perhaps been a bit more realistic with with people because there was an existential threat to the organization uh we were in a very serious situation um and and i should have perhaps been uh clearer up front than i was but you know i did i did go with a i did go on the positive um approach because i thought people just needed to be assured uh that we were going to be okay even though i'm not sure i knew we were going to be okay at that point um but you know it was about just getting in front of them and trying to to talk to people uh i had to present myself very quickly as a as an outsider uh i couldn't pretend that i knew everything about social housing but what i could what i could do was demonstrate that you know um i i've got a number of years of experience in some some complex and tough environments and you know it's about providing clarity so that's kind of where i went with this uh, i tried to talk to people as much as possible uh, i don't flinch from any questions that have been asked of me i've got very thick skin i'm not easily offended and all those things i think got me through um and i think the organization is now fundamentally different than when it when it was then amazing and we'll pa unpack that and how important mm -hmm. was it just to have the right team of people around you as well because clearly you didn't have the housing experience but like how important was the leadership team at that point well yeah it's interesting because everybody was pretty new right. um <laughs> it was absolutely fundamental that jules booker stayed in the organization for me because if she hadn't well i i don't think i would have done to be honest i think i would have walked away um her, her experience uh her her judgment was absolutely imperative I had to make a very, very tough decision early on, which I don't want to go into the details, but it was a pretty tough decision. And uh, suddenly from three down to two uh, uh, in an exec team, and I had to then trust uh, new heads of in the business who I got to know very quickly. Uh, most are still there. 
some didn't didn't uh, uh, have moved on, but most are still there, which is Amazing. which is excellent. Um, so I had to trust them very quickly, and I had to trust their judgment very quickly, and I had to had to understand who I needed to listen to, and who had the you know who had who had something to add, and who was just you know who was just sort of throwing ideas in there for the sake of it. Um, but no, I'm very very lucky that uh, that team uh, built around me. Uh, w- was fundamental, and I I will look back at that, and I still look back at it now. I'm always been a great believer in in you're only as good as the people around you anyway. 100%. Uh, and since I've been in the CEO role, I realise that more than ever uh, because ultimately <laughs> yeah. my job is is you know is about how they perform, uh, and I have to trust them. So that's where we got to. Um, yeah, and it's been fundamental. And I I, I, I you know we we then built the team. We got Emma Richmond in. Um, after a period of time, Emma came with an enormous amount of housing experience as well, as well as development experience and asset management experience. She was a brilliant addition to the team. And since then, we've got a really tight executive team. There's three of us. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been talk about whether that team needs to be bigger. I, I, will, I will resist that on the basis that I think that, that we, we, we fundamentally trust each other. Yes, We're honest exactly. with each other. And we have all the loyalty that we need in there. Amazing. Um so you go and see the regulator. I mean, yeah. as a non-social housing professional that's not done that yeah. before, tell me about that. I mean, how do you make that decision and what is that like and, and how did that process unfold? Again, it, 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 at that point, it was almost being done to me. Um, so we go off to Manchester, and I still remember the meeting, and we go off to Manchester, myself and Jules, and we, we, we're going to meet the the regulator Never met them before. Uh, I I don't know who they are. Geez, I've experience with them, but I haven't. And I really thought we'd go in and it'd be a very cordial meeting, and we're <laughs> going to go, hey, look, you know, we've got some issues, and we'd like to come and tell you about them. And it was the coldest meeting I think I've had in twenty years, and you know, it's awful. And and I just came out of there, and we looked at each other and thought, oh dear. And and it started there. And and the first thing I had to do was convince them. Uh, at, that I was able to do this because, of course, the first thing they're looking at is here's this bloke who's come from Balfour BT. He's been working in here by by now about eight nine weeks. The board have just put him in as chief exec or interim, uh, and and you know he doesn't know his what he's doing. Um, uh, and you know it, it 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 took a bit of time, but I I built a relationship with with the regulator, and I, I have to say on the other side of that it became really positive. Um, again, because my experience was, I'm, I'm a very open person, uh, I'm very straightforward, so I, I, I became that with them, and interesting that they became that with me, um, rather than you know let's let's play the regulator card all the time. So we started having some very open, transparent conversations about the difficulties. Um, they never told me that I, I they 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 didn't think I could do it. Uh, I knew that in the background they must have been questioning my ability to yeah. uh, to steer us through this complex situation. But again, I would always say this, and I'd say this to any board now, that that w- the one thing that people said to me, either to my face or certainly to other people, was, oh, Peas and Blaine's have got no chance. Mark's got no experience with the regulator. Um, it's a very complex world. It's very difficult. Um I can look at any chair, I can look at any chief exec in the eye and say, I've got vast amounts of experience of dealing with the regulator now because I was with the regulator on a constant basis. And, um, yeah, I, I'd come from a regulated environment. I'd worked in schools, I'd worked in education. Yeah, of course. You know, uh, it, it's just another meeting, really, isn't it? But you're just trying to understand where you are with things. Yeah, no, I agree. And and as if it wasn't hard enough, we then went mm. into a global pandemic. <laughs> so, um, I have to say, James, that was the moment where I, I, I did swallow hard and think, yeah. can oh. I do this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, that's, it, just, it, that's some 12, 18 months, that, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of coming out the other side because uh, so we, we, we started to fix the problems well before the regulator uh, gave us our regulatory judgment because we went to the regulator in September. You actually get your regulatory judgment and you downgrade in March the following year. But if I'm being honest, we we were well on, and I recognise that that's the process. But we were well on with fixing the problems, and we 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 had a program called Foundations that we started to put all our data together, and it was a root and branch review of the whole business. Yeah. So we were we were fixing the issues. I, I I have said this to the team. If we weren't well on with that process as we were, 
I don't think we'd have been able to get through the pandemic. But I think it was a demonstration of the strength of the organisation, even at that point, that we were we were able to to get on. Um, I, I, hats off to our uh, IT department because you know overnight I was frustrated that we were. We couldn't even when I first started. We couldn't even manage a conference call because I remember one of the only times I really got frustrated was trying to organise a conference call and it just wouldn't work. Right. To everybody suddenly working at home overnight, uh, I was panicked by keeping our uh, um, customer facing team safe. We had very little guidance from from government. We were almost invisible, yeah. um, but so we were still having to do all the things we were having to do. But we were, we weren't being considered. Uh, in, in, in as part of you know that sort of emergency response, even though we were, um, the team were brilliant around me and right down to every person. You know, we 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 took some decisions around you know furloughing staff, but then we, we quickly brought them back. Um, we panicked for a while about our ability to you know we all thought that perhaps nobody would be able to pay the rent. Um, we, we quickly got through that, and we just had to adapt. And I think our ability to adapt. Uh, really did demonstrated the strength of the organization. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, and I have to say, I did have several sleepless nights and I was, I was, you know, very concerned about staff's welfare, customer welfare, all the other things, but, uh, construction sites stopping. That was a, that was a, that was a period where it was very alarming. And then we were quickly back on site few, you know, it, 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 so it just, it was just, if it wasn't one thing, it was another in the pandemic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And I suppose you'd already conditioned that muscle, that resilience muscle, hadn't you, as an organisation yeah. 12 months prior. Yeah. So it's another kick, but actually, and you know, all the health thing was awful. But as a leader, I didn't know what to do. I honestly didn't have a we, There was no history or narrative of how to deal in these situations. So every well, day exactly, was something... James, that, we're in the same position. <laughs> nobody else could, you, you couldn't look at anybody going, what do I do now? Because no, nobody what? knew what to do, did they? No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but some were a lot further ahead on their digital transformation. So some people had mm. teams. We were on like desktop computers. We had to buy right. laptops. It was it was a nuts period. But so so talk to us about the business as it is today. So just give us yeah. a helicopter overview for the audience in terms of peaks and planes yeah. as it is today and how it stands. I, I mean, I, I would I would say uh, where we are now. I mean, first things first. We we're 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 an agile organization. We still got our front front-facing staff but our our uh workforce still works in a very agile way um i've resisted uh the move i know some in the sector have started to bring people back to the office we've actually let half the space in our office we own the block yep um we we deliver our services in a fundamentally different way and i think for the better uh, that's allowed us to recruit uh to certain roles which don't require to be in the office from a much broader pool now you know, North Cheshire, Macclesfield, that was what was one of the challenges, um, competing with Manchester, competing with Birmingham. Uh, you know, I, I've got um, one of our staff, uh, she lives in, in Port Rush in Northern Ireland. She's fantastic. Huh. And she joins us on teams. She comes over about every six weeks. I've got a member of the finance team that lives in Abersock. You know, the, the, these are all benefits to us because we can deliver, we can recruit really good staff um from a much wider pool but i think where we are now we've got a we've got a, a clear strategic plan we're back to growth we, you know we had a period where we were you know uh, i suppose you could describe it as the emergency um we're back to growth we've got a, we've got a whole new board uh new chair uh we've got we've, we've got our g1 back we are now v2 we, we were g1 v1 for a period but now we're, G, we're a v2 like most other organizations yeah, yeah. uh but we've got a strategic plan um which which makes sense and is coherent and we can deliver because we've got the finance in place uh our customers um their voice is getting louder and and we're listening to that they're challenging us more which is great um we have an excellent team we have really good staff retention um you know so i i think the future is bright i i you know and and as we started we, we all start with we're faced with all sorts of challenges in the sector. Yeah. Um, but I think we're in a really good place to to be able to resist most of those challenges. Yeah. And I mean, how I suppose we've we've skipped a big chapter there from yeah. COVID to, to, to today, but how proud of you that you stuck to the journey and that you stuck together with with, with your team and, and you've you've come out the other side of it by the sounds of things. Yeah. 
It was, yeah. I mean, I, when I think back personally, and it's and you've got to be careful to to be too personal when you're a CEO. But personally, I think yeah, I am. I'm very proud of the achievement because, um, you know, I, I did I did set off in in the darkness a little bit. Um, I had a great team around me. Um, we we worked really hard uh, to get us back where we needed to be. Uh, yeah, the day. The day we got our G1 back was was a really special day. Um, it, it it was, and and I felt it for the for the staff because you know some of the staff had been through it. It's not nice working for a G3 organisation. There's very very few of them in the sector. Certainly was when we when we were a G3. Yeah, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's hard to look your tenants customers in the eye, uh, particularly when the regulatory judgment says that you you know you, that you've they were they were at serious detriment and things like that so yeah it was great and and it was um it was it was a it was a big achievement for me but uh i'll go back to the fact that i am a yorkshireman so i like to underplay all these things yeah that, of course i was gonna yeah, say you don't you don't want to be too proud for too long <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I know when we spoke offline you mentioned that you know there was some real corporate behaviors that you had to yeah. bring in to drive that change can you explain what some of them were and, and kind of what the yeah. impact they had as well one thing that dawned on me quite early on was, um, you know, my former life at Balfour Beatty, anybody who convinces themselves uh, that that uh, when you work for a PLC, that you're there doing the greater good for mankind. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, but you've got to, you know, you can, you can take what it, you can take from it what you want. But the reality is you're there to drive shareholder value from your investors. And, you know, it, it was great working on public infrastructure nhs schools etc because you're delivering fantastic facilities but you're delivering that to drive a profit and you're delivering that to deliver shareholder value so you know one of the advantages of working in this sector is you come into this sector and you know you, you're not doing that but the reality is we're in all but name a commercial organization um we have one source of income predominantly rent uh and and our our tenants pay their rent that's the deal and we look after their properties we get do get some grant to deliver uh, uh some new homes but predominantly it's rent there isn't a magic money tree and i think that's the the first thing that kind of everybody needs to reflect on and the other thing i talk about a lot is that um uh, going back to that point about shareholders i see our tenants as being the shareholders it's their rent uh, they give they give us their rent and the deal is that we look after their properties and provide services uh, that, that they require and demand and we listen to their voice treat them with respect um and and that's the kind of commerciality that i wanted to bring into this which is we need to look after every pound they give us uh we need to do uh um yeah. more for less or more for the same uh we need to drive out waste um and we need to make decisions which which often not often sometimes are unpopular of course uh because they're not very pleasant decisions but you have to make those decisions because that's the commercial reality of, of where we are because ultimately it's about delivering those services so what so i i try and remind people of that on a regular basis and and i must say once a week our only income is our rent and it's our tenant rent it's not our money uh, and they give us that money and the deal is that 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 we deliver the services that they expect and i think that's standing us in good stead as we go forward and and i know you also spoke about this profit for purpose as an mm. organization how do you apply that mantra at peaks and plains and how do you make sure people are i suppose corporately behind that messaging yeah, the, the, the profit for purpose bit is, and again, I've talked to staff about this, I've talked to the board about this. Uh, I, I I don't see the P word as being a problem. I think some people do, and they call it all sorts of things, margin and all the rest of it. <laughs> the fact is we, 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 we have to generate margins, profits within our business so we can do the things that we need to do to, to, to improve our properties. So that that's the, that's the bit uh, that I think people sometimes want to hide behind we you know we, we get a pound if we spend one pound five we, we won't exist um so i'd like to drive as much profit as i can within our business yep. because all that profit is plowed back into the things the purpose that we do so going back to the shareholder before i'm not paying a dividend that purpose is that i give all that money straight back into the business whether that's paying staff retaining staff providing staff with the, the benefits, the, the salaries they deserve, whether that's improving people's homes, whether that's uh, 
uh, monies that is going into to carbon efficiency and so on and so forth. So I, I, I'm not I'm not hiding behind that. That's the things we need to do it, it, to give to to go back to something like EPC cost carbon efficiency. Um, we're way way short, like every other organisation, of having enough money to do what we need to do. Yeah, so we need to be as efficient as we can with our spending, so we can do more of that. So people can live in decent homes, uh, and they can live in homes that don't cost them a cost them a fortune to heat. Um, yeah, so it's 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 one of those that when I when I asked for that to be in the corporate plan, some of the staff were uncomfortable with it. Some of the board members were, members were uncomfortable with it. But once I think you spend some time talking to them about it, you know, I think people start to to, to feel more comfortable with the concept. Why why is it a taboo subject profit in the sector? Because it, it doesn't go anywhere. It goes back into the communities and sector. So I never understand that. But why do you think it is such a subject like it is? Uh, uh, James, I don't know. I I I think it's it's the the issue is that there's some sense that we're taking something away, right. uh, and that we're doing something that we couldn't we we shouldn't and couldn't be doing. I don't agree with that. I think if we were taking that money away and wasting it, if we were wasting that on 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 you know frivolous activity that isn't core to what we're doing, I would be up for that challenge. I would be up for 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 you you know or others telling me that we shouldn't be doing that. So I think the custodians of that are to say, well, okay, we generate that return and that return is ploughed back into providing better services, better quality homes and so on. I think once you drift away from that, you're right, I would be up for challenge. But I don't know why people are, are, are concerned don't. about it. And I don't know whether it's where we've come from, if it's if it's uh, stock transfer or if it's the charitable status, I don't know. Um, but it's just something I've been comfortable around for, for a number of years, so it doesn't concern me. No, no, agreed. And it's not going into bonuses and things like that. Like you say, it's not no, frivolous activity. No, no. It's not going into those no. things. Um, and, and how important has it been for you to lean into some of the past stuff that you've gone through as an organisation to almost create that success for your future? Um, I think what I had to do, and I think my temptation was to almost, uh, uh, I suppose, going back to a reflection, you know, it was easy for me to say this is year zero, um, but actually, the organisation had existed for a number of years before. Uh, we were we were entrenched in the communities. We were providing decent homes in in decent, solid, proud communities. Uh, uh, our tenants, customers, had been there a long time, well before me. Uh, and I think we just needed to to, to reflect on that um, and remind ourselves that what we needed to do is get back to the fundamentals. Um, you know, as an organisation, we took our eye off the ball. That's fair to say. But once we once we put the pieces back together, yeah. um, you know, we we've we've been around a long time before stock transfer. After stock transfer, uh, we we are part of the communities, um, and I think we just need to reflect on that um, sometimes. And that's a challenge for me. Yeah, and it's easy for new employees and new colleagues to come on board and not realise the history. And the history is yeah. quite important, isn't it? Because those. Yeah battle scars for want of a better term are actually quite important to the heritage of the yeah. organization as well yeah you and, can't and you can't look back uh but 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 to ignore it i think you do it at your peril yeah of course yeah. and as we look to the future obviously there's quite a lot of current political upheaval i'll call it yeah. <laughs> on the sector do you think much will change with the change in government or i mean that's where everyone is and i don't get political normally on the podcast but mm. if we were to change will anything change or will we have similar experiences do you think i've got a presentation with my board tomorrow and uh, i was just reflecting on where we are really um 16 housing ministers in however many years uh it, it, it you know you you can't understand the brief you can't understand the complexities of the whole housing sector never mind social housing um it, it it's it, it that that has to be something that has to be addressed hopefully by the new government one of the things that, that really frustrates me is um this current government keeps referring to uh, uh, the stigma of social housing. Um, and I think that's something that, that that's their language. That's not my experience of, 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 of our tenants. Um, and that frustrates me. I think that the, the new the new government in whatever form, but let's face it, I suspect it's likely to be uh, um, certainly uh, a change of colour, um, a, a Labour government or, or if not a coalition. I would hope that social housing would actually have a decent voice at last. Um, my plea, though, is that they try and take some time to understand social housing yeah. and try and understand what it is and what it isn't. Um, 
And the other thing is, I think the fundamentals of, you know, you talk about planning reform and you talk about uh, uh, land use and you talk about all the other things that, that we could bring up, that they're, they're, they're so entrenched uh, in, in, in our economy and uh, our infrastructure that it's going to take years to resolve. So anybody who comes in to think that they can just quick fix it, I think we need to we need to uh, take some time to understand that there's going to be some patience needed. I always think with a change change of government, I think particularly with a Labour government, uh, they always arrive with a lot of hope. A lot of people put their hope in them and say, right, OK, things are going to get better. We remember the song. You know, it's going to take time. It's really hard. Is there any money left? I suspect not. Um, you know, we're just going to have to get to grips with some of the fundamentals. There's a there's a big queue, isn't there? There's the NHS that needs resolving. There's transport issues that need resolving. Uh, you know, we're one of the many issues that need to be resolved. So I, I, I live in hope, but I know it'll take time. Yeah, and, and for me, I don't like this political football nature of housing being used as the, mm. and then it all just disappears once, someone's, once yeah. someone comes yeah. into power. So I'd rather it was more thought through. And certainly, as you said, we need some stability, don't we, at the housing yeah. minister level, for sure. Um, I think I, to, to pick up on a point that I'm really acutely aware of, though, particularly since I've been in, in the sector, is, you know, we, we, we sometimes forget as a sector the fundamentals of what we bring. Um, you know, you think about some of the terrible experiences that people are having in non-secure, non-secured sort of rental properties, tenure types. Uh, you know, that, that that must be an awful situation for a lot of people to be in unaffordable rents or or, or short-term tenancies or or no-fault evictions and so on. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we need to be a bit louder about what we do and how important we are in those communities. And I think we'll be here. Uh, on the other side of that. And I think what we need to do is just push for a bit more of a voice and a bit more of a role in terms of the good stuff that we do um, in, in, in society. No, I agree. And, and talking about that, actually, one thing I wanted to ask you, probably twofold for you, actually, but with the sustained media coverage that we get mm. as a country, how bad housing is, apparently, and knowing how good of the work a lot of the stuff we're doing mm. is, um, how do you keep morale high? And I suppose from your perspective, how did you keep morale high when things weren't going so well for peaks and plains? Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you what we, because again, you look, you look at some of the issues. I, I, I wasn't in the sector with, with the awful issues around Grenfell, but certainly damp and mould and the issues in Rochdale. I, 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 I kept reminding our, our uh, team um, that, that we make our own decisions and we make our own choices. Um, yes, these things are an issue, and yes, you will hear a lot of noise in the sector. But you've got to look to, look at yourself in the eye and say, "Is, is that us?" Uh, and if it is, do something about it. Of course. And if it didn't, uh, then then you know, let's make sure that we that we remind ourselves of that. Um, the other thing I, I try and do is take damper mold, for example. We 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 immediately started to talk about damper mold with the staff. Um, and and we, we we as a as a team we sat down in front of everybody and said okay look this is the issue uh, does anybody feel that we're in that situation could this happen to us you can never say never um, is anybody concerned about these issues and we tried to, to to address these things head on sometimes it requires you, you to hear things that you don't want to hear of course um, but also then remind people that you know the the stuff we do do is is pretty good so and then we also put lots of stuff out to our uh, tenants and reminded them that you know if they've got concerns please get in contact we'll we'll have those conversations um yeah it, it, it's 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 a constant it's a constant um challenge in terms of the amount of noise but i think i'm pretty lucky that i've got a workforce of 160 i can get to them i can see them uh you know we're very visible and if people feel they have concerns they can they can get in touch with me or or any other uh, exec director. So, you know, I think we're doing okay on that. Yeah, exactly, and that's why I do the podcast. Right, these things when they come up need to be reported on. Mm. I don't like it when the media starts to turn it into something it's not because there's a yeah. lot of good stuff. And so, I think the idea of the podcast is talk about the challenges and but actually celebrate some of the successes. There's yeah. some great things going yeah. on in our sector. Um, one final thing for me, I suppose, is what are you looking forward to um, in the future now that you've got peaks and plains back into a good place, and and what are some of the things that you're hopeful for in the future for the sector? Well, to to sort of bring it close to home, we we've, we've I mean I, I'm I'm always driving 
uh, more for less. So it doesn't change. I think everybody thinks that we're going to get to it. We're on a culture that, journey. That's the Yorkshireman in you as well, that by the way. I'm going to get every penny out of this. But also we're on a culture journey. And I think, you know, it's one of those things where culture journeys never end. So yes. I'm always wanting to, 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 to drive that culture through. The challenge for me is to make sure I don't become stale um, uh, and, and complacent because that, that's, that's an issue. Um, but I always try and keep myself positive. Um, I think the issue fundamentally is we're operating in a really difficult environment. Um, again, going back to where we were before, having some clarity about the way forward, uh, I think, would help. Um, seeing some positive uh, um, economic news coming through, which would be helpful. Um, I'm concerned about um, local authority cuts because that's going to be tough for them. So we need to work closely with them because that 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 puts some of the most vulnerable people in society, and particularly in our homes, at risk. It's about making sure that we that we that we can we can address their needs. Um, you know, but I, I'm really, I'm really positive and really hopeful for the future. We've, we've got fundamentally an excellent organisation. I'm very lucky in the communities we operate in. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it all feels positive, and we're pointing in the right direction. I just wish that we could have some um, uh, long-term clarity in terms of we've got a, we've got some fundamentals coming our way. For example, the rent settlement, we need to know where we are with that because it's very difficult to, to plan your business. Um, we've got some issues around um, potential changes in skills, new types of skills required, new qualifications. We need some we need some clarity on, on that. Um, and we, we've got some challenges around how we deliver on the EPC agenda, but um, we're really well placed to be able to, to, to address those. Yeah, amazing. I think, um, I mean, you won't do it yourself, so I will. I think you need to give yourself a pat on the back on your team for, for pulling peaks and planes out of the mess it was in, in terms of it was a difficult situation and you've come through it. And I think the future's bright from what from what you're telling us. But mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing your insights and being very candid. And uh, and I look forward to, to tracking the journey beyond this. Thanks, James. Good Cheers, to catch Mark. up. Uh, and I'll, I'll see you soon. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Hip. If you'd like to hear more from us, please be sure to follow us on your favourite podcast platform. We are also running a 30-minute clinic free of charge to any clients that want to recruit in a more inclusive way. For more information, please reach out to us on our website, andersonjames.com.